Okay, so yeah, I'm going to record this lecture and also, again, I'm going to upload it on YouTube and share you the link uh, immediately after uh, finishing uploading on YouTube. So yeah, this particular um, uh, topic is extremely interesting and I'm personally very passionate on this topic because I'm also the part, I'm, so, I'm, I'm also a part of this movement. Mm. And I feel that um, this is a very important issue, issue that you need to know. And it also depicts the current development of psychological research. And it might also impact your, uh, your future uh, career that you want to build uh, as a future psychologist. Uh, it could be if you want to do research in psychology, for example, then this uh, issue would also help you to improve your uh, your studies, your, your future studies or your future research. And it could also give you some kind of uh, insightful information uh, that that also uh, push you to 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 question to question the state of our current knowledge. Yeah. So uh, the idea of these issues is that um, it is based on the uh, very fundamental basic of the very fundamental notion of science is that uh, if, if, you, if we uh, trust scientific findings, uh, we assume that uh, those findings, those claims are, should be, it would be closer to truth if uh, someone else observed the same thing as we are. So if we observe one thing and, uh, and other people could observe the same thing as we are, then we could uh, be sure that the phenomenon that we observe is real, yeah? So, so it's a very a basic uh, fundamental notion of science. So we, 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 should be, we should be making sure that we don't observe uh, one thing alone and we make sure that everyone else could do the same as we do, yeah? So that would be the, uh, the thing that, um, that is very fundamental in these issues. So uh, before, uh, we proceed on these uh, issues. I I would like to uh, to ask you to imagine, yeah, to imagine um, a condition where uh, maybe when you when you were walking on the Mawangsa Street, for example, and then you met someone that looked like your ex. Then when you look this person at a glance, you might not be so sure that this 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 person was actually your ex. And what you did, uh, what you did, then you go. You're going to take a turn, and you're going to you're going to see uh, once again to make sure whether those uh, whether this person uh, was actually your ex or not. So after second observation and then third observation, you could be more sure whether this person is actually or not actually your ex. So repeated observation could lead to a more conclusive evidence, a more conclusive claims. So if you observe one thing once, you, can, you cannot be so sure that this phenomenon is real. But if you then found the same thing, like twice, the third times, or you, you find it basically all the times, then we could be sure, sure that the phenomenon that we observe is actually real. So that would be the basic idea of replication. Yeah, so we could be so sure that that the theory is closer to the reality if we are not the only one that observed that. We are not the only one to make sure, we're not the only one to have the data to confirm that the theory is real. Yeah, so that's the basic idea of, of doing science, basically. So that's why in, some, uh, in psychology, there are some theories that is really hard to confirm uh, that's it's really hard to confirm the evidence in the real life and sometimes those theories is really hard to falsify so you could not confirm nor reject yeah the claims that has been made by by several scientists for example in psychoanalysis Sigmund Freud was not he was notably uh, he claimed that that human behavior is basically the a product of unconsciousness process but this unconsciousness process is that it came out uh, from a very limited observation so that there are lots of uh, adopting evidences, conflicting evidences so that people have a hard time to actually confirm 
or reject the idea of psychoanalysis. So that's why sometimes people could argue that psychoanalysis itself, it's hard, it's hard to falsify, it's hard to confirm or disconfirm the theory, and it would give us a hard time to, to, to distinguish between imagination and theory. Imagination isn't a reality. So, um, so that's why some people would reject uh, the idea of teaching psychoanalysis in undergraduate program in psychology because we, we basically we don't have, we, 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 can, we cannot confirm or disconfirm the theory. Yeah. So, uh, so that's why if you want to uh, separate the credible and the, the, in, the not credible findings, not so credible findings, in psychology, then uh, the one thing that you could do is that making sure that if those claims were assessed or were assessed by other people or other research teams, they would lead to uh, the same exact uh, the same exact conclusion. So if I do research and I found that uh, something is incredible, for example, if I have if I find the correlation between uh, personality with the tendency of people driving in a high speed, for example, then if Kania do it did exact same thing as what I did when I do when I uh, with the process when I then um, when I then uh, uh, gave the same conclusion, Kania should also give the same conclusion. So then you could you could also say that my claims is trustworthy because other people could confirm that. Yeah. So. The whole research process should be replicated independently and so that we can sure we can be sure that the claims is legit and credible and we should find it trustworthy. However, the theory and also the reality, there is a huge gap that sometimes people don't uh, don't they don't really aware that this gap is much higher and much problematic than it's actually are. Uh, the problem is that some research, not only some, but a lot of research in psychology, it gives us a lot of hard times to actually replicate its findings. So what you read in the psychology textbooks, it's really hard to actually believe what people have found in those studies because some of them are not replicated and it gives us a hard time to distinguish between the myths and also the scientific findings. And this condition induced a crisis that we call a replication crisis. So this replication crisis is 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 a recent crisis that uh, that psychology is that psychology suffers and currently suffering, and we don't know until when. And perhaps after we come to a realization that the current way of most scientists do their job is extremely problematic. And why, why this is a problem? Yeah, maybe you, you, you keep questioning yourself. Why actually a replication crisis is a problem for science? Um, there are some troubling uh, conclusion, troubling indication that uh, replication crisis may indicate that some scientists, they just simply, they don't do their job well. And some, and some psychological research, uh, some psycho psychological phenomenon or psychological theories that you have learned uh, from your uh, from your previous courses, it, it may not be real. Yeah, so maybe what you have learned about unconsciousness in psychoanalysis, it could be not real. Yeah, so it's really hard to distinguish between what is real and what is not. While science is actually our only tool to discover and to distinguish between between what is real and what is not real. <laughs> And also the most troubling uh, uh, indication about why a replication crisis is happening is that it could be also an indication that uh, the scientists, they, they basically did a extremely bad uh, research. And it could be also uh, our, uh, your textbook is actually flooded by sloppy, well, basically unrigorous research. So that you must doubt that and question that constantly. And the second and the, another thing that also I find I find it quite, I found it quite troubling is that uh, some researchers there are good researchers and of course there are bad researchers. Uh, some of them uh, are committed 
to a serious uh, ethical violation. Uh, some of them are even fabricated the, their whole data. So the research was never happening. So what they did was just made up some data and report it as if it's real, while it's actually a fabricated data. And psychology is one of the disciplines where uh, those kind of behavior is rewarded. Yeah. So not only it is uh, silently accepted, but sometimes it could be rewarded. Yeah. But after this uh, replication crisis, people are becoming more aware on the honesty and also the transparency of the research. So they would reward transparency more. And I will explain to you about this, this transparency movement later. Yeah. And another, and as actually, um, um, I'm going to bring you the good news. So it's not only a bad news, well, sort of good, good news is that the psychology is not the only disciplines that is suffering from this crisis. So you would see a, a, a very clear pattern on, on other disciplines, such as the medical sciences or biological, biology sciences, or biological sciences, or even um, economics, even uh, experimental politics or even sociology and it's basically um, it it suffer it flags every a, a lot of disciplines and uh, the most troubling consequences for example if you do research in medical science and your research confirms that one treatment proves uh, to be effective in curing one illness while it's actually an error that you made in your research so you you actually you, we formed completely wrong and misguided conclusion about this research, and it will cause uh, lives of lots of people. Yeah, so I think it's quite present with the COVID-19 situation. Uh, maybe you have heard about some studies that, uh, that, tried, to, um, that tried to seek uh, the cure uh, of the COVID-19 situations, and some of the drugs uh, were proposed uh, for treating a COVID-19 patient. Some of the drugs were initially used in, in malaria, uh, in treating people with SARS, uh, and, some, and some drugs uh, were used in, uh, in cardiovascular disease, uh, blood thinner drugs or something like that. And you can imagine the consequences where, uh, where the scientists, they did sloppy research, they don't... Uh, formulate the research design carefully and they don't uh, give the, the exact conclusion uh, about this, about their research, and it will cause a lot of lives. It's, it's extremely dangerous and very serious. Yeah, so this is, um, this is uh, something that's uh, extremely troubling, not only for psychology, but also for many, many disciplines. So um, the problem is that the questions in, uh, that, is al that also arises why replication studies? So why when someone else doing my research design, they could completely came out, come out with a completely different conclusion as I, compared to what I found in the initial study. So uh, there are several possibilities why people couldn't, uh, couldn't find, uh, couldn't, uh, couldn't lead to the exact conclusion as the initial study. So the first, a uh, possible explanation is that this, the, the, the spatial location could be different. So I would, I perhaps do my initial research in Surabaya, but then if I redo my research in other cities in Jawa Timur, for, for example, in Malang, for example, it could be also an explanation why uh, the research uh, conclusion could, could diverge from the initial study. But the problem is that how much is actually, um, how big is actually the, in, the, the influence of the spatial location? Because as you, uh, as you have learned from the other uh, meetings in this course is that, um, well, basically science has this kind of ambition to seek for a general pattern of human behavior. So it's actually violates the, a lot of, uh, a lot of um, uh, a lot of ambition that we uh, that we try to aim when we do research. Yeah, so basically we try to create we we try to find the general pattern of behavior, but why our research findings is bounded to a very particular or very specific location? So this that, that doesn't make sense. 
So sometimes it's really hard to actually measure or estimate the effect of, uh, of spatial location or specific geographical location to, um, to, uh, to, to research conclusion. So one way to eliminate this possibility is that scientists now, they do research in multiple locations at once. So instead of doing research on human behavior in the United States, so we do now doing it parallelly and we're doing it uh, in the at the same time, also in some countries as well. So not only in the United States, but also in Algeria, also in Albania, or in Russia, or even in Indonesia. So that's why we could, we could basically, we could um, avoid this uh, possibility by doing research in multiple locations in order to, uh, to see whether there are variation across the geographical condition. So this is, this is why you, you found that a lot of uh, psychological studies nowadays uh, for the recent five years, they tend to use, ten, they tend to uh, use the approach of team science, whether they have a large team of, of researchers across the countries, they basically do the same design, they apply the same design, but it involves a lot of participants from different places, yeah? And also the second possibility is that the one who do the research are different. So if I do the research and I get the same one conclusion, then if Kania did the same thing, it could be also because basically the one who do the research are different. So the experimenters are different. But again, this possibility is extremely nonsense because again, we try to seek for a general pattern of science general pattern of human behavior, general pattern of knowledge, so that if different people lead to different conclusion, then, what, then who should you believe? And then you don't need to be a scientist then to have a scientific opinion. Yeah, so that's extremely nonsense. So even, so the experimenter, what they should do is that they report transparently and thoroughly what they did in their research, so that other people could do the exact same thing as the initial researcher have done. So they don't have a hard time to actually do what the initial researcher had, had done in their research. Or it could be perhaps the materials of the research. Yeah. So it, it, it could include uh, the design, the materials, or perhaps the instrument would be different. So maybe I'm doing research in to investigate depression. I did, I used a scale to measure depression as I told you in many, in, in several, um, in previous meetings. Uh, there are many, many ways to, <laughs> to measure depression. Yeah, so if I, if I use one scale and the other researcher use different scale, even though it also measure depression, it could be also the basis, could be also the possibility why the conclusion could be different because we measure even though we measure the same construct, but we use different tools to measure the same construct. That could be the, um, the reason why there's a variation of, of scientific evidences. So that, to remove this possibility is that if you want to report a research uh, of research uh, processes, then we have to be very specific and very, very transparent in what we have done in our previous research, so that other researchers could do ex the exact same thing as we have as we have done in our research. And also, it could be uh, other than the materials that we use for the research, it could be the operationalization, yeah, of 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 the of the construct, yeah. So it could be if I'm measuring, it's not only the differences between the scales, yeah. The, the tools that we use for doing research, but how we define our construct, it could be different. For example, if you want to do research on motivation, then uh, if someone else wants to uh, do this, uh, the, uh, the same research on motivation, it, then in order to lead to the same uh, conclusion, the consistent con uh, conclusion, they have to have, uh, 
consistent operationalization, consistent definition on that same construct. So if one researcher, the initial researcher, they operationalize motivation according to Freud, for example, but then the second researcher who wants to replicate their studies, they define, they define uh, motivation according to Maslow. It's the same motivation, but they completely different operationalization. Then it's possible that they will end up with completely different conclusions. Yeah. So in order to, um, of course, in order to, to answer the research questions, then completely different definition would lead to completely different measurement strategy. So that's why, and that's where the conclusion of replication study would diverge from the original ones. Yeah. And the last one, the last possibility, why replication study uh, completely diverge from the initial study, it could be on the population properties. Yeah, so maybe they use um, different gender proportion. So the initial study has more uh, male participants, but the replication studies has more female participants, for example. Or maybe different sampling technique. The other one use probability sampling, but the replication study use convenient sampling, for example. Or perhaps they use different age groups, different age, um, um, mean age. So uh, the first study, the initial study, has younger mean age, but then the later replication study, they use a, a participant who has higher uh, 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 average uh, of, of their age. So, so basically, they are older than the uh, initial study. That could be also the possibility why uh, replication studies uh, could be completely diverged from the, uh, from the initial study. Uh, so before we moving on, uh, if you have any questions or comments, just let me know from the chat room or just just cut me off and then start talking if you have any questions. So so far, if you have any questions, no, I assume no. All right, so I'm going to proceed. Yeah, so this is a very um, informative uh, video that would give you the glimpse of uh, replication crisis and how it how it causes lots of problems in uh, in in the current state of science, not only in psychology but in many many disciplines. In 2011, a team of physicists reported a startling discovery: neutrinos traveled faster than the speed of light by 60 billionths of a second in their 730-kilometer trip from Geneva to a detector in Italy. Despite six months of double-checking, the bizarre discovery refused to yield. But rather than celebrating a physics revolution, the researchers published a cautious paper arguing for continued research in an effort to explain the observed anomaly. In time, the error was tracked to a single incorrectly connected fiber optic cable. This example reminds us that real science is more than static textbooks. Instead, researchers around the world are continuously publishing their latest discoveries, with each paper adding to the scientific conversation. Published studies can motivate future research, inspire new products, and inform government policy. So it's important that we have confidence in the published results. If their conclusions are wrong, we risk time, resources, and even our health in the pursuit of false leads. When findings are significant, they are frequently double-checked by other researchers, either by reanalyzing the data or by redoing the entire experiment. For example, it took repeated investigation of the CERN data before the timing error was tracked down. Unfortunately, there are currently neither the resources nor professional incentives to double-check the more than one million scientific papers published annually. Even when papers are challenged, the results are not reassuring. Recent studies that examined dozens of published pharmaceutical papers managed to replicate the results of less than 25% of them, and similar results have been found in other scientific disciplines. There are a variety of sources for irreproducible results. Errors could hide in their original design, execution, or analysis of the data. Unknown factors, such as patients' undisclosed condition in a medical study, can produce results that are not repeatable in new test subjects. 
and sometimes the second research group can't reproduce the original results simply because they don't know exactly what the original group did. However, some problems might stem from systematic decisions in how we do science. Researchers, the institutions that employ them, and the scientific journals that publish findings are expected to produce big results frequently. Important papers can advance careers, generate media interest, and secure essential funding, so there's slim motivation for researchers to challenge their own exciting results. In addition, little incentive exists to publish results unsupportive of the expected hypothesis. That results in a deluge of agreement between what was expected and what was found. In rare occasions, this can even lead to deliberate fabrication, such as in 2013 when a researcher spiked rabbit blood with human blood to give false evidence that his HIV vaccine was working. The publish or perish mindset can also compromise academic journals' traditional peer review processes, which are safety checks where experts examine submitted papers for potential shortcomings. The current system, which might involve only one or two reviewers, can be woefully ineffective. That was demonstrated in a 1998 study where eight weaknesses were deliberately inserted into papers, but only around 25% were caught upon review. Many scientists are working toward improving reproducibility in their fields. There's a push to make researchers' raw data, experimental procedures, and analytical techniques more openly available in order to ease replication efforts. The peer review process can also be strengthened to more efficiently weed out weak papers prior to publication. And we could temper the pressure to find big results by publishing more papers that fail to confirm the original hypothesis, an event that happens far more than current scientific literature suggests. Science always has and always will encounter some false starts as part of the collective acquisition of new knowledge. Finding ways to improve the reproducibility of our results can help us weed out those false starts more effectively, keeping us moving steadily toward exciting new discoveries. Right, so that would be one of the um, quite elaborate um, video to sum up the whole idea of replication crisis. So, right, okay, so we proceed on to the next uh, topic that is um, you might find that you might find that uh, the term could be either replicability or reproducibility so sometimes people use this those two terms interchangeably so I'm going to give you some kind of um, explanation what is actually uh, what actually what people actually mean by saying uh, one, uh, by saying that uh, research is replicable or reproducible so sometimes people use those uh, two terms interchangeably. Uh, some people would say that those two words are, are basically the same thing, but some people would argue that uh, replicability and reproducibility is completely different conditions. So we say that one research findings uh, is replicable is that when the same design, so the same research design, but when the same research design uh, is performed by different research teams, by different researchers, and they redo all the design uh, by themselves with different participants in so that they produce different data from the initial study. Then if they apply the same uh, data analysis strategy, then they will find a complete exact conclusion uh, from the initial study. So we, then we, we could say that the research is replicable. So if I do uh, one research that confirms the correlation between, let's say, personality traits with the tendency of people driving in a fast speed, then if someone else redo my experiment with my exact design and they redo the experiment with different participants and they, of course, they have different data from my data and then when they lead to the same conclusion as I am, then I could say that my research is replicable. But what we mean by reproducible is completely different uh, terms, actually. So if someone else tried to check my data, so of course this data came out from the same design as the initial study, uh, and it came from um, uh, one initial study, and then another researcher or another research team, they tried to recheck all the analysis 
and then they try to redo all the analysis according to my analysis plan and when they came to the exact conclusion as what i found in my research then i could say that my findings is reproducible so without having without doing redoing the experiment so they completely basically they just reanalyzed my data and they came to exact conclusion then I could say that my research is reproducible and you might be surprised that is there any situation where someone else reanalyze our own data and they will lead to and they will find completely different conclusion as we are it's very possible so the answer is very possible and there there was one study that I read um, it says that a group of researcher uh, they gave uh, 56 uh, different uh, research teams from different institutions, the same data set with the same research question. So the research question is, is practically very simple. So they ask the researcher to find evidence whether a referee in a, soft, in, in a football match, whether they would give more cards, yeah, more yellow and red cards to, uh, to people who has darker skin than the lighter skin. So it's very simple. So they just want to know whether a referee would give more cards to people with darker uh, skin, skin color than the lighter skin color. So it's a, it's a fairly simple research question. So they give those uh, research teams, the 50 research team, the same data set. And they came up with completely different uh, ways to analyze the data. And sometimes they could find completely different uh, conclusion. Some people would say, yes, there is a differences. There is a tendency that the referee um, uh, that the referee could give more cards to uh, to play uh, to a player who has darker skin color, but they could be, be could they could disagree on the magnitude whether it is extremely more likely or perhaps somewhat more likely. So the magnitude of the of the of the likelihood that could be different. Yeah, so even though they came to, ex to the same conclusion, yes, there is a def differences. There's a tendency that, uh, that the referee uh, give more cards to the, to, the, to the player who has darker skin color, but they disagree. Uh, there is a variety of result when they describe the magnitude, yeah, the magnitude of the, those differences. So, it, so this also lead to the conclusion that, um, that the same data could mean various ways yeah, if you do analysis in many many ways yeah, because there are tons of ways to analyze the data and again if you want to do replication studies there are two ways to do that either you do it exactly as the initial study or you just try to redo the experiment uh, you basically you ask the same research questions but you do it differently from the initial study it could be also it could be also done yeah, so if you want to do exactly the same as the initial study, we call it the exact replication. But then if you want to only ask the same research questions, but then you operationalize it in completely different ways than the initial study, we call it conceptual replication. So I'm not very sure whether you are um, familiar with the lines here. Yeah, so these lines are from the Solomon asked conformity, conformity uh, research. So basically they ask questions to a group of people uh, where, where uh, among of, uh, where most, well, where in this group are mostly actors and the participants, one participants among this group is actually the research participants. And the researcher asked the group uh, which, uh, which lines here that has the same length as these lines and the groups are intendedly gave the wrong uh, uh, wrong answer to look whether those uh, whether that participant would comply or would conform to the group minds or they would diverge from the uh, from the group's conclusion yeah so it's a it's a very classic uh, replication a very classic uh, social psychology uh, studies and if we want to redo this experiment then we should use the exact same materials as Solomon as did yeah so when he used the lines like he like here and if you want to do replication studies then we use the same lines yeah the same materials 
But if you want to do conceptual replication, then we can change those lines because, because lines are boring. Then you can use maybe fruits, uh, maybe fruits pictures to replace the lines. Then it means that you have modified the research materials, but still the concept that you are testing is conformity. Then we can say that what, what we do is that a conceptual replication. So I, I hope that I made myself clear, but if you have any questions, please feel free to ask, yeah? And then, yeah, so this is the continuum of replication. So basically, if you do all the same thing as the initial study from the hypothesis, from the research questions, and then your variable or exactly the same, how you operationalize it, the population characteristics, including age, gender proportion, for example, even the research materials itself, procedural details in, its, in your experiment, or even the physical settings are exactly the same, but the only thing that are different, that is different from the initial research, is the contextual variables. The context would be quite hard to replicate because you do it in another, um, in another population, in another person, another group of people. So contextual variable, of course, this is the only thing that you don't, uh, that you don't, uh, that you don't replicate in your research. While Conceptual replication also have some gradation. If you have exact same hypothesis, exact same research question, but you then conceptualize your variables differently from the initial research, then we could say that you're doing verified replication. And the possibility of having, of having, rep, of having uh, unreplicable or or failing to replicate the studies would be higher if you do a conceptual replication. So the possibility of getting the same exact result is higher if you do direct replication. So that would be the uh, uh, some ways to uh, to conceptualize what uh, replication studies are. And I'll give you some information about um, uh, on some recent studies. Uh, on the E4, and, the, and some people end the four to uh, to answer the big questions: Are psychology is psychology actually replicable? Can we trust psychology, a psychological uh, psychology uh, as a science? Could we actually trust them? So there there is a huge collaboration uh, from a group of researchers uh, across the world, and the first project that they did to confirm whether psychology is suffering from this uh, of this crisis this replication crisis is conducting a project that they call reproducibility project of psychology so RPP. so this is a classic studies that people talk about <laughs> like several times yeah it's a one of the most important uh, psychological studies uh, in our decade for example uh, if i say yeah so um so here um there, uh, there are uh, what you see now in your screen that uh, there are two uh, diagrams to describe the differences between the original study, yeah, the initial studies that these three, that those researchers try to replicate, and they compare it between what they found in their replication studies and they, and and what initial initial studies has found. So what you see here is that something that we call effect size here, yeah. Maybe this is a one of um, the, the thing that is easier to explain than p value, yeah? Because um, at some point in your, in, your, uh, in your program, the whole program, you, you will initially, you will eventually uh, uh, learn about p value, but I think effect size is much easier to explain here. So when a researcher uh, confirms uh, claims about something. For example, if I claim that um, that I found a correlation between uh, personality traits with a tendency to drive to drive a car in a high speed, then as a researcher, I have to report the magnitude of my claims. Yeah. So if I have uh, if I if I claim that there is a correlation between personality traits uh, with a tendency of a person uh, driving in a high speed, then I should explain to, to the people 
how big is the correlation? Is that very strong? Is there a very strong correlation? Or even very weak correlation? So it, it describes the whole idea of magnitude of my claims, yeah. So for example, if, uh, if Bandura, yeah, if Bandura claimed that, that modeling, yeah, giving a, a child a model, yeah, to, uh, to, to do aggressive acts, for example, how much it would influence the kids to reproduce their violent acts, yeah. Then Bandura should explain how much is the influence. Is it huge influence or big influence or maybe small influence? And that in psychological research or in stati statistical terms, we call it affect size. So it describes the whole idea of the magnitude you know, of the claims. So in most, uh, in most psychology, psychological research, the affect size is claimed here. Let me see here. It's more or less, it's 0 0.3, yeah, 0 0.3. And 0 0.3 means that it has medium affect size, yeah. So if you see that if, uh, if, it's, if a psychology researcher says that they found something, it's actually only a medium effect size. Yeah? It's only medium um, uh, effect size they, they could only found in, this, in their research. When those research are replicated in this reproducibility project, the, replication, the replications uh, found that it, it is actually much lower than that. So it almost close to one zero, a one point, one a uh, one point uh it's less than one point a uh, sorry zero point one yeah it's less than that even less than that so it reduced almost one uh one per uh, it's almost um it's more than a half yeah so it's more than a half than it's reported in initial studies so when psychology researchers claim that they found moderate affect size in the real life it could be much lower than that yeah, so the actual, the reality that we try to describe here yeah, in our research, it is something that basically much lower, it is much weaker than we, than we found in, in most psychological research. And it's quite troubling because 1.3 is not, it's not strong actually, yeah. So it's not like a huge or phenomenal affect size that we could claim that something has a strong correlation to something. Yeah. So even in medical sciences, uh, if you decide one treatment could affect uh, could affect health outcomes, one a zero point three is not is not phenomenal. It's only arbitrary yeah, to determine whether one treatment could cure one illnesses, for example. Yeah. So it's it's very weak. And it's much weaker in reality. Yeah, it's it's quite shocking. And some people even try to replicate findings that have published in several journals. And these four journals, those four journals that you've seen on your screen, that you've seen on screen now, are um, basically the best journals in psychology, most prestigious. And most researchers in the world, they they could uh, spend more than three years to publish just one article in those four journals. And when people try to replicate the findings of studies that have been published in those journals, it's extremely shocking, yeah? Some research, uh, some, uh, one journal, yes, yeah, a social psychology is actually the worst offender uh, in psychology, yeah? So some people would say they don't believe anything that came out from social psychology. That, this, that does make sense because, yeah, we're the worst offender. So it's only less than 30% could be replicated, yeah? The best one, the best one we come up is that the cognitive psychology just must, it's slightly more robust than, uh, than, than social psychology. Well, actually not slightly, but much more robust. And social psychology, they could at least uh, uh, replicate 50 percent, more slightly uh, more than 50 percent of those findings. Even though this is again not so great, because we could see that only slightly uh, less than 50 percent, or perhaps just false positive. So they claim to find something, they claim to uh, to discover something, while it's actually it's not happening in reality. So yeah, so we have problems, yeah, and I'm, and I'm 
basically I'm continuing to describe lots of problems yeah, after this. And another uh, research, human research, it happens in somewhere, I think 20, 2017, if I'm not mistaken. So it is many labs too. So people try to produce uh, some findings in social psychology and even some findings, some claims, some theories, uh, you've seen that on your textbook, yeah, in your textbook. So it's it's quite uh, um, it's quite um, it's quite popular actually, yeah. So one of them, something like moral foundation theory, it's extremely popular in social psychology, or something like correspondence bias, yeah, or trolley dilemma. Maybe you have heard that the the dilemma of the moral dilemma by the trolley problems, yeah. It perhaps it, it happens to be less than the initial findings so the effect size that uh, that that were found on the replication studies is much less than initial studies even though it is replicated uh, replication studies confirms that the effect exists but actually the effect size is much lower than the initials than initial studies so this is why people sometimes often assume that what you've seen in published studies it is exaggerated reality yeah it does not reflect the true reality, but exaggerated reality. And I'm going to tell you the strange case of fluxetine. So this is very troubling. So I'm not very sure whether you you have heard about this uh, about this drug. So the drug is often used to treat patients with depression. Yes, very popular. Maybe you have seen uh, some popular movies uh, where the actors uh, they taken the the the, the medicine. Uh, it's very popular in the US or even in Indonesia, yeah, the, anywhere in the world, basically. Uh, the pharmacist, they, uh, they sold this drug with the name of Prozac, yeah? So it's, it's very popular antidepressant. But the most troubling part is that when researchers tried to compile, yeah, compile all the uh, clinical trials, they tried to investigate the effectiveness of this drug, yeah? So bio, in biomedical sciences, when a scientist want uh, they want to confirm the effectiveness of the treatment they what they do is often they do they use clinical trials so they basically try to compare uh, the condition or the health outcomes between a group of people who taken the drug and some group of people who taken otherwise so they could take a pill without an effect the placebo pill or maybe they could another they could take another drug that are seen was the best uh, treatment uh, available. So, what a what meta science uh, meta scientists do is that they compile all those research in order to look at the bigger picture of the effectiveness of this group of this drug, because again, one single study doesn't tell you much information. Because if you were walking on Darmawangsa Street and you saw someone who looked like your boyfriend, your ex boyfriend. And what you did is that taking an, another turn to make sure whether it was or, or he was not <laughs> your boyfriend. So again, one single study is not enough to confirm something. So what most scientists do, they compile all those research and then they take a conclusion based on the data available on those research. So that's what we call a meta-analytic study. So it's a, it's a more advanced uh, design to confirm of scientific evidences from published literature. So we don't uh, do experiments again, but what we do is that compiling all experimental, expe expe uh, experimental evidences, and then we make conclusion of, uh, based on those data. And surprisingly, after doing a meta-analysis study, researchers found that it's actually not so effective. So it tended to be a placebo. So basically it's not, more effective than taking a pill with a sand inside or perhaps a with flour inside so it basically it does not there is no differences between people who have taken this drug or people who basically not taken this drug even though there is a uh, differences between those people it's only a placebo because of placebo effect because people believe that the drug is effective and then it takes some effect and again some people would say that no it's not that useful but the, in reality i told you that 
this drug is extremely popular and some psychiatrists still use them yeah for treating patients with depression and could you imagine that something that is proven to be ineffective but people still using it anyway so how much money uh, has been wasted goes to waste for a drug that not even effective yeah so it's extremely devastating and it's very common yeah in bio even in biomedical sciences the, this kind of mistake this kind of phenomenon is extremely prevalent and some people would argue why this myth of antidepressant could exist uh, for so many years people st still keep using it even though the data says otherwise yeah so there is a devastating and obsolete uh, use of the terms of statistical significance i wouldn't go uh, to explain this further you will get this in uh, when you when you take the quantitative research methods and uh, the lecturer will give you an exhaustive explanation about this p value stuff yeah it's extremely important and you will get that later and some people would argue that because those clinical trials they use completely flawed and distorted or even manipulated research design so the way science works is that you make prediction you make hypothesis then we do experiments and then we confirms or disconfirms our hypothesis based on the data but what these researchers often do is that they make hypothesis they make prediction then they test uh, their hypothesis by doing an experiment but when they do, when they look at the data and the data disconfirm their experiment what they do is that they change their prediction and then in a way so that as if the data confirms their prediction so they adjust their prediction yeah to 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 match with the data which is completely nonsense yeah so it violates the way how science actually should work yeah so it doesn't make sense if someone change the prediction when they look at the data already yeah it's not prediction it's post prediction because you you make conclusion after seeing data and in in that ways you can confirm anything that you want right so you don't need a hypothesis you can confirm basically everything that you want and that's not how we do science yeah and the third possibility is that sampling bias so perhaps in those clinical trials they pick people who has fewer or milder symptoms of depression so that yeah so that if someone taken the medicine it looks like as if they have relieved yeah the symptoms as has been significantly reduced well actually they only pick people with milder symptoms and another thing would be uh, maybe a follow up a follow up study so when the, the researchers backed and they measure the outcomes after the treatment after uh, 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 a certain periods of of the treatment when they come back to the participants and try to examine their condition after taking the drugs it's only like very short period like after taking three days of those medicine and then the researchers come, come back and examine their condition of course in such short period of examination they will always find an effect then that doesn't make sense because you know depressive uh, depressive symptoms could last more than two months <laughs> why, why in the clinical trials they already the researchers all, already follow up the participants in three days that does not make sense at all yeah and again this is the problems that we have everywhere and it described and also it indicates that our current state of science our whole body of literature is basically biased because people love good news people only love hearing uh, discovery they don't really like the negative result so what researchers do they only report positive findings and they keep negative or no findings inside their drawer yeah so they don't publish that they only publish good news because people only love good news the journals love good news my supervisor love good news everyone loves good news but that's not the reflection of reality because i tell you the reality that if you want if you if you somehow become a scientist no results and failure is most often 
outcomes, most often cases that you that you found um, throughout your career. So success is very little actually. So positive findings is much, much less than the negative ones. But the problem is that our body of literature, they're full of positive findings. And where are the no findings? And that's the big questions that nobody could answer. Yeah. And it could be also the way where, it could be also a possibility where the researcher actually confirms only information that confirms their belief. They only want to trust what they want to trust, but they ignore completely, yeah? They ignore completely information that contradicts their belief. And it's pretty much similar what you found in partisans, yeah? In, in Jokowi or Prabowo supporter. They only want to believe what they want to believe, yeah? And that's not how science works, yeah? Right, so the next case, it's, it, 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 it is extremely strange and extremely disturbing yeah so i want you to imagine when i uh, when i give you a long list of words yeah i give you that and then i ask you to remember those words as many as much uh, as many as possible and then after that i want you to recall those words yeah some words blah 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 and you for example from a hundred words you could recall 10 of them then after that, I chose another word randomly from the list, yeah, from the list. Then I ask you to type some words, yeah, to type those words that I pick randomly from those lists. And strange things happen. Uh, it appears that you could remember, yeah, you could remember a better words that you type later, later when I gave you something to type, yeah, randomly. And it make me it makes me conclude that wow you can you could actually predict the future because you could remember words that I will ask you later to type. So that is amazing. You could you could predict the future. So it's actually based on real experiment, yeah, real experiment in a psychology in psychology, uh, and it basically um, confirms it tried to conf it tried to confirms that people could have uh, ability to predict the future or something that we call C or precognition. And this research is, it <laughs> didn't came from a confused undergraduate student, but it came from a well-respected uh, psychologist from Stanford University, not from Erlanga University. You could say so, yeah, well, you could say that, well, it, it could happen if, if it happened, if, if it did, if it, uh, conducted by someone from from our campus but no this is something from that came from Stanford and what makes it quite interesting is that uh, he did nine, uh, 10 experiments and he get and he got nine positive results out of 10 uh, of 10 experiments which is interesting yeah so people could actually predict the future yeah but then people uh, after reading the, the 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 manuscript people were not convinced that people could actually have ability to predict the future, but then they have suspicion that Bem did something nasty with the paper, something nasty with his research, so that he could frame it as if he discovered something. Yeah. So what people did was they they became very curious, and then they tried to redid the experiment. Some people did that, and they didn't find anything. Yeah. So. It could be basically the biggest hoax of all time, yeah? So they didn't find anything. And what is actually happening? <laughs> you know, why did Bam could make such a big claims, yeah? Um, the problem would be he, he, he actually, perhaps he did not do 10 experiment. He could, maybe he, he, he might do like 100 experiments and he only reported the ones that has positive result. <laughs> so it's not... It's not actually the whole story, yeah? So he, maybe he did like 10, uh, 100 experiments and then he just reported uh, those who has positive result. Or perhaps he hides something. <laughs> yeah, he hides something. He hides uh, some condition that he didn't report in the article. 
or perhaps he needs are several uh, dependent uh, variables, yeah. And, um, and he only reported significant ones. So the, those who does not have positive result, he kept it uh, in his drawer. But perhaps he generously rounding the p-value, so I'm not going to um, explain to that further, but it, um, it has some correlation with the, uh, with the causal inference. I'll tell you, I'm going to explain to you that later if you, if you are in the <laughs> research method course. Or perhaps he changed his prediction. So he formed his hypothesis after seeing the data. So the whole idea of hypothesis testing is just flawed completely. Yeah. So if we, again, if we change our prediction after seeing the data, it means that we could confirm anything, the, even your wildest dream, you can confirm that by your data because you can conveniently change your prediction all the time. And it could be. Uh, BAM could throw away some undesirable data to make it prettier than it actually looks. <laughs> and then, of course, maybe he stopped uh, the data, stopped uh, collecting data after having convenient results. Or perhaps the, um, the most viable one, maybe he just lucky. <laughs> yeah, he was just lucky. And if you ask me which possibility is most possible, Nobody knows except Bab and Allah. Yeah, so he actually never, uh, never uh, admit it uh, uh, openly what he actually did with this with his research. So what he did was almost like he became very defensive and he kept talk nonsense to people, and it it makes people uh, curious about the nature of his research. So people then uh, starting to people started to look at their past research and they found the same uh, weirdness and in, uh, inconsistency in their past research. So, so it confirms that the pattern of, uh, of of violating research ethics is is completely common in psychology, even in the most prestigious institution like Stanford. Right. So it's disturbing. Why it is disturbing? And then it came to a conclusion that maybe what you read in psychology textbook, that one of them, I gave it to you, it could be untrustworthy. So it's, I, it's when the first time I, I learned about this reproducibility crisis, I was having like existential crisis as well, because I was like, what I did, what I teach um, so far, is not it's just basically a lies i don't know which one is true and what is actually not i'm I, i'm not in the position to um to to tell students which findings of which theories are closer to reality and which of them are just plainly rubbish so i kind of feel guilty in a way that i i teach a lot of things to students but i'm not quite sure anymore Oh, what 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 are real, and what are rubbish? So, are those studies actually reliable? Can you trust them? So, what is exactly what? And worse, can you even believe that psychology is scientific? Are you doing science or just blindly talking nonsense here? Yeah. So it's like inconvenient truth that maybe uh, the way we do science, the way we think about science, should be somehow uh, reformed we could not uh, 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 we could not maintain the old ways of doing science and even though crisis is is a part of science as you may have heard from Thomas Kuhn he said that basically science is a, as a shift of paradigms we have a crisis and then after it seems it seemingly we have resolved it another crisis is waiting in the door for the door so it's basically another uh, a constant uh, condition of crisis yeah so but this this one this particular process is extremely disturbing because it means that uh, it puts you in a position to question whether what you have known currently is actually closer to reality or just plainly imaginative and again if those findings that you have learned from your textbook are mostly false positive then what makes it different from hoaxes that you that you found on social media? It's just exactly the same because you couldn't 
you couldn't distinguish between what is real and what is not. Yeah. And uh, when I told you about the tendency of researcher to keep their null findings, yeah, when they fail, they don't openly share it to their colleagues. I told you that us, the psychologists, we are the worst offenders. So as you said here, in, as you uh, seen here in, on your screen, that uh, people in psychiatry and psychology in some uh, journals, more than 90% of the time, yeah, more than 90% of the time, we claim that we find something that does not make sense. Because at least in psychology, uh, after a rigorous analysis by a statistician, uh, he claimed that, uh, that psychologists, uh, averagely, they only have probability or possibility of detecting discovery only 50% of the time. Yeah, so realistically, yeah, we are 50% false. Yeah, and we 50% right. But in our published studies, we said that we confirm our prediction more than 90% of the uh, of the time. So that does not make sense at all. Yeah, so where are the negative findings? Where are the null findings? And now, this is the good news, yeah? So I gave you all the bad news behind, and now I'll give you the, the, the good news. So of course, uh, I'm not the only person who feel disturbed about this condition. Uh, there are many, many people before me who felt that the current state of science, it needs, it needs to be reformed. Uh, researchers should change their ways to do research. And they have to do so by adopting transparency. So the idea is that if you, if you want to be trustworthy, if you want to be seen as credible, then the only thing that you should then we then uh, the only thing that we should do is that we have to be transparent. We allow people to correct us if we if we have mistakes, and of course having a uh, if we were we were working alone and we don't allow people other people to to correct our mistake or we check our work, then how could we claim that our findings are credible? So that's the idea of this credibility revolution. So researchers, they don't want to be seen as these bad guys and sloppy uh, people, yeah, uh, like the lay people, like most lay people, but they want to be seen as credible, trustworthy, and reliable. So that's why people want to adopt more transparency in this process. And before that, before we proceed to the next uh, issues on the credibility revolution, so what psychologists, research psychologists did, have done, yeah, to to correct their mistakes, yeah, to read, uh, to uh, to repel, yeah, to repel their sins, yeah, to uh, to redeem their mistakes, yeah. Uh, I give you um, opportunity to ask questions. So if you have any comments or questions, please do drop me questions on chat room or you just cut me off and start speaking. Right, so I assume that there's no question, so I'll give, uh, so I'll proceed. So, um, so yeah, maybe you've heard something that, um, that is, uh, that has a uh, big names now, it's something that we call open science. And um, people, uh, some researchers, they are very fond to the idea of adopting open science to their research practice, so they adopt uh, collaboration, they adopt um, immediate uh, dissemination of their research findings, they try to share their materials to other researchers, and they allow people, they allow other people to correct their mistakes by making sure that all materials, all research materials that they use are openly accessible to everyone. So what makes it hard uh, previously, yeah, to check to correct other uh, people's mistake is that when you came to Bam and asked uh, ask his data, he he refused. Yeah, he refused because he didn't want people to check uh, what he did with his data. So that if people are refusing to give their data to other people, to other researchers, then it makes it people hard to actually uh, know, to actually understand what they uh, did with their research. 
So basically, adopting open science means we, well, the researcher uh, uh, committed to uh, to contribute to collaborate with other people by making all their materials available, and they also not only making those available, but they allow people to reuse their materials. So if I drop my scales perhaps everywhere on the internet, I gave everyone permission to use those research uh, to use those scales for the for research purposes for example so that i'm not only making my materials available but i also i also give other people permission to reuse my materials and of course it facilitates reproduction to data analysis and it facilitates everyone to learn uh, what's going on with, with with the current state of knowledge and as you may have heard that uh, currently uh, indonesian uh, some indonesian institutions such as ikman uh, Ikman Institute and also uh, our university, which is Arlanga, uh, they just recently deposited a, a genome sequence data from COVID-19 viruses to a open repository of genome sequence uh, data uh, from, uh, I think it's GSET if I'm not mistaken, and they gave the data freely available to everyone so that all scientists could analyze and track the mutation of the virus which is incredible idea because like um, a, perhaps a century ago the idea of sharing rapidly data could not be in everyone's mind so it's it's extremely prevalent now people are trying their best not to hide their secrets yeah but making it freely available so that everyone could learn together yeah so uh, open science is actually a very broad term yeah so it includes even open education materials. So teachers now, they try to put the, all the materials open and accessible to everyone. So it's not only tackling the research quality, not only improving the credibility of research, but also uh, tackling the problems of inequality, yeah? So, we, so we're living in the, um, in the developing countries. We actually, and frankly, quite frankly, we are lagged behind uh, uh, people who lives in a developed countries so that making those available meaning that we distribute knowledge uh, to uh, and we reduce inequality of the distribu distribution of knowledge so that people in developing countries we could catch up our uh, our uh, our um, uh, what we lack of now so that it also tackling the issues of a more justice and equitable science which is incredible idea. So I love this idea because it's not only um, an answer to improve research credibility, but also a solution to tackle research inequality and resource inequality. And in psychology, uh, there are two important uh, organizations that are actively promoted uh, the use of open uh, research practices and they actively promote this to many, many people, and surprisingly, it's not an easy job. Yeah, even though they try to promote this in developing, in a, in a more developed countries, such as in the North Europe or in the North America, but they face a lot of resistance, yeah, from, the, uh, from many, many researchers that who wants to, uh, who wants to uh, maintain their old ways of doing research. And so this, this, this movement is, is, is going on now. Uh, and it has been uh, around like 10 years now, or more or less, yeah, more or less 10 years. And it's growing around the world. Yeah, even in Indonesia, we have a group of people who are actively promoting the idea of making research data available, making all research materials available, making it more accessible to everyone. And surprisingly, not everyone likes the idea. Yeah, so not every, because not everyone likes uh, their work to be checked by other people. <laughs> And the problems of, of conveniently adjusting prediction uh, could be solved by doing something that we call pre-registration. Yeah. So people now, uh, the idea of doing science is that you formulate your hypothesis prior to data collection, but to make sure that you're actually doing it and not slightly adjusting it after seeing the data. So people now, they deposit, so they basically, they try to register their hypothesis their prediction prior to collecting their data 
in a online portal and the portal is timestamped so people could be sure other people could be sure when the prediction is actually made and then they would not to make sure that they would not conveniently adjust their hypothesis when they see the data and of course it would it will improve the research practices and you might you, and you might have uh, questions that if people do so then we see the rise of null findings so people would say that they don't find anything instead of they find anything and you're absolutely true there is a rise of null findings in in the last decades in most psychological research uh, so pre-registration basically works as intended so it produce more new result than, uh, than, than the positive result. And I told you that null result or negative findings or null findings are actually as important as positive findings because it reflects the reality and it allows us to correct ourselves. So science itself, it, it's not only, it only needs, it, it does not only need a discovery, but it also needs self-correction. Yeah, so we need self-correction at the same uh, at the same point. So we are unhealthily obsessed with uh, with making discovery, but we forget about self-corrections. Yeah, and of course, adopting this transparency it improves credibility because adopting transparency is really hard. It's really hard. So most researchers, even in the North America, or even people in the North Europe, they would confirm that it's extremely hard to adopt these practices because there are lots of things, lots of extra things and lots of extra skills are needed to actually improve their credibility of research findings. But some of people, some people would say that those hard work will be paid off because, you know, we could be so sure that we, that we've done a very good job and it's a robust finding and people could check our error, our error, our mistakes. And of course, if, we allow people to access our research materials. It means that people can use it freely, and of course, it, ha it gives us a greater impact than just keep it ourselves, right, yeah? And also, the, another um, trend that is going on now is that the rising uh, popularity of meta science. Yeah, so meta science is a scientific discipline that concerns on doing research on research yeah so people try to evaluate uh scientific existing scientific findings in order to find patterns and they try to identify mistakes and corrections so as you uh, as you seen previously on the video that i that i played previously it says that in one year averagely there are uh, there are one million research articles so that the era of making discovery would not be uh, as important as previously, yeah, as we had before. Yeah. So correcting those mistakes is equally important as making discoveries. So that would be yeah, the spirit of, of self-correcting the science. And meta science itself is extremely popular. So if you are interested in this field, uh, there are lots of materials that I could recommend. And it, if you are aspire to be a scientist in the future, I guarantee you that these skills, this knowledge would be extremely helpful for your future career. Because it's like one of the biggest things happening in the decades. <laughs> yeah. So that would be the end of this lecture. If you have any questions or concerns or I don't know, or comments, please do so by dropping your message on chat room or just Turn on your um, microphone and start talking. Mm, I assume that no questions and no comments. I hope that you actually there. Well, are you still with me?